We have now entered channel three of remote viewing. Thank you for sticking with us. We have plenty more awesomeness to share with you. Uh, Cyrus, my main man, where are we going from here? Well, let's just go down the list that we've already cre- created here. With Wait, okay, so we're going to follow believe, the rules now. I guess. A title I believe that uh, you were the one who saw. I didn't actually get to the, I'm sure, superlative uh, documentary on superheroes called, appropriately enough, Superheroes. Yes, this uh, enigmatic title, uh, Superheroes, is actually a, a documentary about, it, it's an interesting portrait of quote real life superheroes people that uh like phoenix jones like like phoenix jones but unfortunately for some reason he's not featured oh, which i find weird. strange maybe uh, he was asking for too much money or maybe he was busy macing a crowd of people yeah, who knows being arrested <laughs> it's hard to say um but the interesting thing about this documentary is it does cover kind of the full gamut from like the sadly deluded to the oddly inspirational to the borderline sociopathic <laughs> Uh, there's one guy, I believe his name is Master Legend, he operates out of Orlando, and all he does is walk around the city, he goes back to his his van every few minutes and drinks a beer, and then he every goes... Every few minutes? Every few minutes, <laughs> it seems like. Uh, and, and then he goes and, like, kicks doors open that are locked, like, in, in business buildings, and he goes to a bar and has another beer, and then he, like, jumps around on, on lobby fountains. He's basically just a drunk asshole. He's what Rubio would be if he was a superhero. Yeah, and it's time. like, he's being featured next to people like the, uh, I want to say the, the New York Initiative. Yeah. Uh, which is basically a group of people, they have an actual free runner in their group. Yeah. Uh, and then they have two guys whose sole motivation for doing this is that they wanted to beat muggers and rapists to death. So these guys presumably have gone to jail by the time. No, about? no, oh. they because they they wear masks. They do, and, the, yeah. Okay. And uh, the the uh, documentary crew is very careful not to reveal their true identity. Boy, I wonder though. It's not like you're a psychologist if you're like you know, if you're a documentary filmmaker where like the law will protect you. If yeah. you know who those guys are, you, don't you have to tell the police? I, I really don't because I, I think the the way they get away with it is they talk about it, but they yeah. never actually show them doing it. Okay, fair enough. So I, I think they're protected in so much as you don't actually see them beating people to death, but they do talk I don't about. Think so though, I don't think you're you're obligated as a citizen to like. Wouldn't it be aiding and abetting though? Or obstruction of justice. I guess it depends on the laws or... in the state where you are. I'm yeah, not really no, sure. No. We don't have a legal expert here at Remote Viewing, as you can tell. No, we do not. No. But, uh, as the... we drink alcohol and indeed. talk yeah. about illicit drugs. We may yes. indeed need a legal expert at some point. <laughs> More Sooner than rather than later. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 fairly interesting. There's uh, there's really great editing in it. They do a lot of stuff with art. To, like They'll freeze frame and turn it into a comic book panel, which is a lot of fun. But the thing that I, doesn't make sense about it is that Stan Lee is, is like, highly credited on, like, oh, it's basically, like, Stan Lee presents superheroes. Sure. And he shows up at the beginning and at the end to deliver these really generic comments about, hey, true believers, like, hey, if they want to go out and and contribute to their community, like Spider-Man, that's great. And it's like, okay, but do you even know who we're talking about or what this documentary is about, or is that just what you say in your office when you're by yourself? Sure. I just can't stop talking about the Fantastic Four. It's like, shut up. But yeah, I mean, other than well, that, Stanley is a caricature of himself at this point, and that's how he makes a living. And, it, and it's it's just sad because it's like you're not really involved in this. They're using your name to to sell the movie. It deserves to be seen, but that's just kind of cheap, I thought. Yeah. Well, hey, what are you gonna do? Jack Kirby's dead, so yeah, this is yeah. true. Uh, so overall, we're seeing or... overall definitely we're seeing okay. definitely a very fascinating take on on people that are just fed up with not feeling like they're making a difference anymore. All right, so here's one of the titles I was super excited about this year. In fact, this I was thinking about making two lists this year because there were so many indie films that I really, truly loved this year. Mm-hmm. And there were, uh, you know, actually almost equally as many a Hollywood big production films. It was a good year for independent film. Yeah, it really was. And this is one of the, would be at the, one of the top films for that. This is Bellflower, which uh, is, this company put this out, Oscilloscope Laboratories, who have recently become quite... Great company. Yeah, I just really, like, in love with the stuff they put out. Like, they you... put out Rare Export. Which, which is fabulous. Which is do, you, do you guys know who started Oscilloscope? No. Uh-uh. Adam Yock from the Beastie Boys no started shit, Oscilloscope no Labs. Shit. Yeah. Did not know that. The Beastie Boys are the reason that Oscilloscope Laboratories exists, and one of their first releases 
uh, or one of their first acquisitions was uh, Dear Zachary, the documentary that just wow. wrecks people left and that, right. That messed me up. That Dropping the mad knowledge, yo. This is why. Oscilloscope Labs is a great company, and they have <laughs> they've really turned it on recently, picking up uh, picking up uh, indie stuff off the festival circuit. Yeah, yeah, and they're really great at picking the, the super interesting stuff. I also like the fact that they have all right. So, for instance, their packaging, even though it's entirely cardboard and recyclable, and recyclable, is feels really sturdy. Mm-hmm. It has a neat design to it they just it's just well they put cool this weird looking. extra piece in there to kind of just create a cushion yeah so that it doesn't feel flimsy and it's like it's so simple and probably doesn't cost them anything why aren't more companies doing that yeah you and know. it gives them the opportunity to include a lot of art from the film or yeah. other you know quotes and and booklets and all kinds of interesting stuff yeah like i said it's a very attractive packaging you can if such things are so, something that's your concern you can feel good that it's if a this green, is your concern dude it's green packaging yeah and bellflower is the perfect type of film for these guys to choose because they do pick films that aren't the sort of dry indies they pick very kind of you know on the edge very i don't know almost kind of angry like they do a good there's one that wait they are you a, suggesting that bellflower is angry <laughs> maybe a little like <laughs> I think it's really interesting because cyrus obviously really likes bellflower i do i know brian really does not like bellflower oh. and i am squarely in the middle i of it. fucking oh. hate this This should movie. be an interesting <laughs> discussion then anyway we actually reviewed this on the site although i don't know if it made it to the final site front or not i remember Corey was like i don't know how i feel about it and leon and tony were like we hate this movie <laughs> i was like i love it so i it's don't know very very divisive it's uh, not that the it's not that there's not a middle ground because i find myself squarely there but it, it is the type of movie that i think the vast majority of people are either gonna love or hate when that's it's famous for that already the fact that it, it is so polarizing with how people feel about it what you've got the story is of these two guys are obviously lifelong friends who for fun they they're big fans of the Road Warrior, in particular Lord Humongous, and they take their they've got this project where they've been converting a car for years that they call Medusa into the car from Mad Max, complete with big flamethrowers that actually work and various different little uh, like it's got surveillance cameras in it, like it, it did in the movie that you could see like stuff going on around into the sides, uh, smoke screen, all that stuff. By the way, all that stuff actually is real in that car. It wasn't special effects. All that's built nope, into they drove the it, car. They drove that it they've here been driving for around. South by Southwest. Yeah. And, uh, and set off the flamethrowers outside the the South Lamar Draft House. Fairly near flammable people and substances. <laughs> it, did. it was very impressive. <laughs> I was pleased that no one caught on fire, <laughs> but I was also pleased that they did it. Uh, anyway, so they're they've got they've got this kind of you know that kind of guy bonding thing based on a, a shared interest that gets screwed up when a girl go, enters into the picture uh, uh evan gladell by the way plays the main character woodrow uh and uh J- jesse wiseman plays millie this girl's free spirit type who they they fall for each other right off the bat there's an instant connection between the two and it's immediately turns into where the other friend leftover friend is a third wheel uh it over time, it you're not sure where this is going because it feels like it's telling an apocalypse story uh, visually. I mean, because the director did this amazing thing where he created his own cameras completely from, uh, what is it? It says from a prototype silicon imaging SI2K mini. I don't know sure. much about what that is. But. Uh, and SI2K is it's a it's a high-end video camera, uh, d- probably most notably used on uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, but it's it's incredibly modular. In fact, the reason that Danny Boyle used it on Slumdog Millionaire is because basically you can take the lens unit off and it's tethered back to like the sensor and the re- well, not the sensor, the sensor and the lens are together, and it's tethered back to like the recording area of the camera. So uh, Boyle's DP was running through the streets of Mumbai chasing the kids, basically holding the lens you know in front of him and had a backpack with the rest of the camera and a MacBook Pro connected to the camera with the screen flipped around so that Boyle could be behind him and see what he was shooting in front of him. Right, right. I remember hearing that. Um, so it's already a modular system, and they basically ripped it apart. Mainly, the and I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of guessing here, but it seems like what they really wanted to do was kind of do an elaborate tilt-shift photography type of thing. So it was. it seems like it was mostly ripped apart to to re re jigger the lens mount in some way to get these weird focus shifts that they have throughout the film. If, and, if it's not painfully obvious by now, in addition to writing for FSR, Luke does work in the film industry. <laughs> has, and I'm, I'm dead serious. He, he does a lot of uh, editing, and he's been involved with a lot of 
local productions here, which is why when he speaks, it sounds like he's reading from a filmmaker's encyclopedia. <laughs> but that's all off the top of his head. It really is. Like, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, we're sitting here well, just like... Well, I do have my, my Jim Beam and Coke, so. <laughs> It's your instant recall mm, juice. Indeed. Uh, so... You know, it, this has a very distinctive look to it that definitely is going after a sort of dirty, muddled, post-apocalyptic feel, even though ultimately what this is is a relationship film. It's just a very apocalyptic relationship. Hey, well, it's interesting that you that you mentioned that it feels like they're building to an apocalypse because they are. They're building to, you know, the end of, of Woodrow's world, essentially. Sure. As much as he knows it. And it's... Salisbury's going to refute a lot of these points, but uh, what, it, what, notes. It's, Keep talking. what it's going for, what it, whether you agree with how it gets there or how it executes that or not, what it's trying to do is, you know, kind of mirror that devastation and, and feeling that the world has come to an end, you know, the first time a girl breaks your heart. Yeah, I the, totally the agree with you. The unfortunate part is that it tries to get there with this brohemian hipster stroke vest. <laughs> I, I, like right down to the ironic mustaches and the the we're gonna have our first date be a terrible date on purpose. Isn't that precious? No. And quite frankly, I think Cyrus is being generous using the term story because this movie <laughs> is really about two guys that want to build their own car and their own flamethrower, and then one of them happens to hook up with a girl that doesn't really work out. So he decides that he is completely like this this walking entity of rage and gets in these meaningless fights and drinks too much and it's like okay but unless you're Hemingway like that that can't carry a movie and you're not you're you're hipster Hemingway essentially see I gotta disagree with you because I think while it's true that these people are definitely hipsters in that, <laughs> in that angry way that people like to apply the term these days uh, so what you know, they they are indeed still just people that right, are caught but then, up, I don't find young them people interesting. caught up in a fashion of the time, as it were. And I think in many ways this borrows heavily in theme from people like Alex Cox and what they he was doing with films like Repo okay. Man was like, wow, this is a punk rock movie for our time in a lot of in a lot of senses. Well, I will I will say just as far as Woodrow going into a rage, he absolutely does. But holy shit! Like yeah, oh, it's the the impetus for that is I uh, <laughs> mind boggling, and I I won't ruin it because it does happen towards the end of the film. And but fuck, I would have been pissed too. Uh, there's like, some really holy shit. There's some really strange things that happen towards the end of this film that really upset some people and really amazed others. Sure. I, I personally, it blew me away what they decided to do with the end of the movie. A lot of people were just angry. It depends on. You know, I mean, the whole film is set in a tentative reality anyway, and sure. that's clear right from the get-go, but... I will, I'll, I've kind of been playing Cyrus' side. I will play Salisbury's side for a little bit here <laughs> with uh, the best friend character is is just poorly conceived, poorly... He just pops poorly up. Poorly executed. Yeah, he disappears for a little... His motivation is never clear. He pops like, up to say, no worries, dude. Wo <laughs> Woodrow... Okay. Woodrow gets the shit beat out of him and is is recovering from this and uh the the best friend character just kind of like decides to to continue building the car and like yeah. sets Woodrow up in a little chair and you know just and then gives the car to Wood there there's just a lot of things that happen that that don't make sense from from the best friend's perspective and in in more than one way, Woodrow kind of fucks him over. Like, oh yeah, in, I agree. With intentionally, that. like in in ways that like he knows he but knows you're this so is gonna fucking fuck. unmotivated. Yeah, there's no what? reason for him to fuck. I, I mean, aside from the fact that guys like to stick their dick in pussies. Yeah, I which... was gonna say that's some motivation when you're that age. You're uh, just like, you but, know what? I I know that guy's our best friend and all, but I'm. Going but to but fuck he never that. even seems upset about it, and he yeah. finds out about it, and never seems upset. The best friend character is just it's one of the weak links, I feel, in well, the script. I feel like the problem with the best friend wasn't script. There so, much that, so much We're the fact that about he them. was a weak character so much as that it seems like they're establishing him as a primary character right from the get-go. Sure. And then by the time the second reel starts, it's clear that he is a secondary character at best. Yeah, in the whole looking film. back on it, it's Woodrow's story, but that's oh, totally not right. clear from the first But that's act. not how it's introduced as a film. At first, no. as Brian said, it feels like it's going to be a two-film about these guys and their fucking awesome car they're building, which is admitted the movie that you're hoping for which even still is kind of a weak script just a movie about two guys building a car I mean it's, and, and granted I love Road Warrior so this movie should have like reached out and grabbed me from frame one but I couldn't get past all of the, the like little precious cinematography that they were doing and these characters that are oh just 
like enragingly hipster and, and <laughs> they they can't have a normal decent conversation it's always conversations about I, I shit you not conversations about do you like my facial hair like this I don't know I don't know if I really like this and she's like no it's good like, does this shirt work I don't know hey do you want to get some more beer hey we should we should do this contest it'd be totally great if we ate some crickets it's like seriously <laughs> how can anybody like these characters how does Salisbury not like a movie wherein the main character has a car that has literally a whiskey dispenser in the passenger seat that should give you a clue as to how much I fucking hate this movie that oh. couldn't even win me over it's a shame those are the little bells and whistles that totally made this a complete piece for me <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm there stealing that idea from my own that car. shoots flame also has a whiskey dispenser. Two, two different cars. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. It's a different car. But still! And they build a flame, like, you're focusing on the car. They built a goddamn flamethrower yeah. that works. Yeah, they did. Uh, yeah, yes, as well. They... Yeah, they had their own flamethrower. And not just a pussy one, either. That thing's no, got, like, it's a 30-foot range. No, it's fucking flame. Like, oh, my God. And that's, and that's the thing. Like, they had to have built that, like... I'm I, I, I'm assuming here, but I'm assuming that they built the fucking car. They built that goddamn flamethrower too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have that wide shot where you're just like, holy shit! That's <laughs> great. Kill someone. They're the post ironic frat boy Tony Stark. That's great. Ah, <laughs> uh, hallelujah. <laughs> Obviously, we have different opinions on that one, and that is okay. It um, is. And this comes, even though you may not like it, but there's a oscilloscope, and they put together a a, a reasonably nice passel of extras to go with it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Lots of good stuff on here. To, and I will to make say that you know, while while the three of us find ourselves uh, representing all areas of the spectrum on this film. Uh, I think it's at least worth a watch to see if it's your cup of tea. Absolutely, there's some interesting stuff going on, and uh, you know it's worth it's worth checking out for two reasons. It's worth checking out to see if it's something you might be interested in, and also to give money to oscilloscope labs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, hope as much as can. I hate this movie, I I say definitely support oscilloscope. So if this sounds like anything that even might remotely interest you. Buy the oscilloscope DVD, and, and as just a side mention, came out shortly before this, and to, in October, so it didn't make our list. But Rare Exports came out, and, oh, and that's by them too, and that's so the good. best Christmas movie you will have seen in years. Absolutely, and we were talking about westerns earlier. They also put out uh, Meek's Cut Off. Oh well, which, which I hated. But yeah, I heard it was really good, but you know, <laughs> some people loved it. Myself. I'll be glad to loan you a copy. See, there you, you go, lovely. All right, so moving on. This is actually one of my favorite books by Neil Gaiman, Neverwhere. And I did not even realize when I read the book that it was actually written first as a television series or a miniseries. Or yeah, it seems kind of backward. BBC Usually two. these kind of things start as, you know, written source and then they become either TV or movie. And this way sometimes kind of... with BBC, you'd be surprised. Like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, television series first. Mm. Actually, it was a radio show first, then it was a television series, mm. then it was a book. So the British just do things backwards, Apparently, is what we're trying to say. Or is it us? They keep calling everything fanny. I don't, I don't know. They, they say aluminium. I think yeah. we got it right. And yogurt. What is yogurt? God damn you people. Doesn't that freak you out? Yogurt. A little, yeah. Yeah, it kind of makes like, my... Like sp- Yamamir yogurt from the Pittsburgh Penguins? <laughs> Jesus Christ, sports references all over the place tonight. I, know. I blame But they you say guys. herbs, and I'm with that. Yeah, I'm with that too. it. I know, I hate that. People <laughs> herbs. Yeah, I'm going to steal other people's <laughs> jokes. I'm afraid. Go, Eddie Izzard. Uh, so, anyway, this was written by Neil Gaiman, who actually oversees it closely. Uh, it's a... It, it, I don't know what to say about it without spoiling too much. Cause yeah, it's, so hard much to, the, it's hard to describe. So much of the pleasure of this is in the little discoveries that are yeah. constantly in it, and the little just touches and flourishes. But to put it, to just get to the start, it starts with this character, Richard Mayhew, which is a Scottish guy living in London. He's engaged to this woman who clearly is too rich for him and has big ideas of how they're going to be this power couple. Oh, whereas God. he's just a nice guy. He's such and a nice guy, and she is such a... Bitch. She's an uber bitch, and on their way to a big important dinner where he can meet her boss, uh, he sees this injured girl named Dor lying on the ground who's asking for help. She's bleeding profusely. Yeah, so he's like, he's the type of guy who's like, look, honey, you go to the dinner. I gotta help this girl. He ends up bringing her back to her apartment, fucking the shit out. No, wait, I'm sorry. That was my fantasy when I was watching. Oh, uh, right. Sorry. Well, <laughs> see, mine was that it was Peter Mayhew and it was actually Chewbacca, so... Oh, you wouldn't want to have to pick up Peter Mayhew. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so he brings her back to the apartment, not to fuck the shit out of her, but to ostensibly heal, because she says, I can't be brought to a hospital. And uh, it turns out that there's these two really creepy fucking looking guys, uh, who Mr. Croup and Mr. Vandemar who are looking for her everywhere and are very, right off the bat, extremely murderous and pretty psycho. Yeah. Like the big one, the big less talkative one of the pair, Mr. Vandemar, 
bites the head off a rat and eats the rat in an early scene just to be clear that this isn't a regular human. They actually reminded me a lot of Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid from Diamonds Are Forever. Nice. I, I think that was intentional. You in think? Fact. I think that was, it was. If, if so, it's a great reference. Uh, and uh, so he decides that he's going to help this girl at least to get back to her people. He, She says, we'll call on this guy named the Marquis de Carabas, which was played by Patterson Joseph, who incidentally was one of the main frontrunners to be Doctor Who before David Tennant. He was going to be the first black Doctor Who. Yeah, he was. It was. It was. He was in the final casting call and didn't mm-hmm. quite make it to the next level. And he should have. God damn it! Because Patterson Joseph is awesome. Anyway, so you're like, okay, I've got her now. Thanks a lot for your help. Never ever think about us again. The problem is the next day when he goes to work, no one knows who he is. Yeah. No one even acknowledges that he really exists. He'll be practically screaming into people's faces, "Hey, it's me, Richard Mayhew. What's the deal?" And they stop as if someone just threw water in their face and go, oh, hello, I didn't see you there. I'm sorry, can I help you, sir? Yeah. His fiance doesn't recognize him. He gets home and there are people already moving stuff out of his house. Yeah. It turns out that if you spend too much time with the homeless, as these people are in Neil Gaiman's fantasy world, other people stop in London above, just stop noticing you. They, It's not that you don't exist altogether. They just, their brains are programmed, so programmed to just not acknowledge that you exist that you kind of don't. Yeah, anymore. it's it's wearing its metaphor here on its dirty, tattered sleeve. Right. But, uh, I love the fact that they take kind of this fringe element of society and attribute uh, like fantasy elements to it. I thought that was really fascinating. Well, and that's a neat thing. They create a whole fantasy world in London below with this like, you know, there's magic and all that stuff, but really it's just, it's this whole series of fiefdoms and royalty and rules that all go on under the streets with ver- varieties of crazy homeless people you've seen before. Only he, like I said, he attaches magical significance to them. And yeah. it's it's Gaiman at his absolute best doing yeah. what he does, those sort of things, taking the, the regular mundane of life and saying, no, no, there's a hidden and awesome underbelly to yeah. it. Uh, and I love the, the Marquis de Carabas uh, haircut in this movie because oh, yeah. <laughs> he's got like yellow short hair in the front and then dreadlocks in the back yeah. so he kind of looks like Rodman Vanilli like it's very <laughs> strange does. it is an odd look but he, Patterson Joseph is so great in that role and he's one of the main characters in this he's very kind good. of the Han Solo-esque Malcolm Reynolds character of the series um it's a six-part a six series. They're only half-hour piece. It won't take you that long to get through it. And believe me, you'll just be sad that it's over when it's over. This is the 15th anniversary of this thing, so they fixed it up a bit. It's a lot cleaner than it list existed on previous versions, as well as being anamorphic now, even though it is not widescreen, of course. Uh, and it comes with a brand-new commentary with uh, Gaiman and several of the other contributors. So i got to say, I really couldn't recommend this more. It's one of those films or one of those series that if you're at all a Gaiman fan or a fantasy fan or... Or a BBC fan, you you have to pick this up. And yeah, this watch is something it. Cyrus turned me on to, and I haven't seen the whole thing yet, but I have really really liked what I've seen. Okay, well, let's move on and talk about Beginners. Now, I saw this way back at South by Southwest, like a, which is pretty way back now. Uh, but you just watched this, am I correct? Yes, yeah, I just saw this. Luke actually saw it quite a while ago, though. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I saw it back at South. Yeah, and it was one of those films, and I even saw it in the morning screening, and I was all hungover from a midnight show the night before. So even when we did our review, I think I was like, I don't even know how accurate I'm being about this movie, because <laughs> I was not in the mood for a very slow, not laborious, although it seemed that way at the time, but like deliberately paced film about the relationship between a father and his son after the father has already died. Um, and it's, you know, what makes it more interesting, you've got Christopher Plummer as the father, and you've got Ewan McGregor as the son, and we already know right from the beginning, Plummer's already died of, uh, of uh, cancer, cancer, I believe, mm-hmm. and as we're going back through his memories, Ewan McGregor's memories of his relationship with his father, it more or less starts from after his mother died, when his father came out as being gay, and not just a little, <laughs> <laughs> he comes out a lot. Uh, starting a relationship with a much younger man, just absorbing into the lifestyle instantly. And it's not presented in a jokey way. It's just, it is as it is. In fact, it's actually based on the real story of what happened to the director, his father, who was 75 when his his wife died. And he said, I'm gay! Like in... Surprise! Like in brain candy. I mean... (laughs) It was like that. The whole neighborhood sang and danced. Nice kids in the awesome. hall reference. I like yeah. that. Ah, thank you. That should become important later. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's. I mean, a lot of this has to do with with uh, like the differences between the father and son, and the way that and the way that they are the same coming into play as after his father's death. Ewan McGregor's character is trying to start a new relationship with a woman and having gr- big difficulties doing it. 
not because he's gay, presumably, but because presumably. of other di- because of other difficulties. But what, what did you guys think? Oh, I think it's a piece of shit. Oh, you hated it? Okay, I really do. I think it's just a terrible fucking film. I think, uh, not. I hate it when people are like, "You should read my review." But if you have any interest in reading my review, it is up on Film School Rejects, in which I I use the line that it is stuck so far up its own ass that it sees the world through its belly button. And I feel like I earned that in the review, but I swear to God, this movie is just pretentious as all hell. And it's, you know, it's one of those things, it's it's, it's about, you know, rich white people and it's like first world problems and hmm. it's a bunch of shit that you don't care about. It's like, even like, Ewan McGregor has this gold job, this amazing job. And there's this whole subplot where... You know, he's become very famous for one style of graphic design, and so this big band comes in and wants that design for their album cover, and he's so caught up in his own world that he can't just give them what they want, and he wants to do, like, this 13-part series on sadness and loss, and you're like, dude, just do your fucking job. Like, I'm sorry that your life is shitty, but... Do your fucking job. It would be like somebody like, making an indie film about one of us not wanting to review a Michael Bay film because we're much more interested in our and more artistic endeavors. It's like, yeah, but that's your goddamn job. So well, just do your job. If that film came around to proving to that person how stupid they were for feeling that way in the first place, <laughs> then I would totally watch that. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not it's not devoid of value. Christopher Plummer does a, does a fine job, and and you know the, there are some interesting things. I just feel like. Uh, you know, Ewan McGregor stumbles through it as if he's, he's so detached emotionally yeah, from there's, everything. There's no, there's no, there's nothing to latch onto in his character. And Melanie Laurent, as beautiful as she is, is weird for weird's sake. Yeah. It seems to me like they're, the the problems in their relationship seem to be manufactured strictly because there need to be problems. Okay, yeah. it doesn't not, feel genuine at all. Not because there should be any problems between them, aside from the fact that yeah, McGregor is sleepwalking through the damn film. Yeah, and the, uh, I will admit the talking dog is funny. Oh, that's right, yeah. I forgot about the, the dog. dog. The, the, McGregor like and, the, and the dog have this weird relationship where he can McGregor like understands the dog speaking English, which is hilarious. Right, which is even in the movie's context says, okay, he admits that he's imagining. This, yeah, totally. But anybody who has a pet and probably who, people who live alone, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I assure you that my cat never shuts up. I just oh, and I don't mean meow. The biggest problem with the film is that invariably and it, it to me it felt like it was about a dozen times in reality it's probably about four right the film will stop and do a photo oh, montage oh, oh. of this is 1975 this is who the president is this is what happiness was like this is what being gay was like and it's like sure. oh my and it goes on ad nauseum and it's, it's just like so pretentious well, shut up. I, I, like I, I don't give a shit i'm I, sorry I, i'll say this now i hate using the term pretentious because i don't think it really means anything it's like pretentious is I, I so based on your own perspective there's no solid set meaning sure. of it i think that movie is already for Artie's sake really because that other guy explained it pretty well why it was there mm. well it's already for Artie's sake from where i stand <laughs> and so it's like one of those like it's not fair to use because yeah, it it's a difficult so word to people. use in in uh, objective criticism where you're trying to debate someone. right so i've tried to to, to delete that from my my uh, sure. dictionary of terms to use but i actually felt pretty much everything that you're saying, <laughs> saying it. I, I thought it was laborious i was sitting there and i know admittedly i was having trouble keeping awake except for when the dog was talking but i was like okay i get it i get it he's gay they had a difficult relationship already that just made it weirder and now he can't fuck this hot chick yeah. okay. well i mean I, I actually found it i still think it's pretentious but it and this is completely accidental and it works against itself but i found it after a while appropriate that they were just stopping to show these like disjointed images of things that you're like hmm that may be interesting but it may not i don't know because there's no context to it mm-hmm. because sure. i feel like a lot of the movie is just all of these like marginally interesting plot points that might be you know worthy of of introspection and, and digging deeper into but they don't assign any emotional weight to any of it <laughs> so it's like you're just looking at a bunch of pictures of shit and it's like you can't you can't invest in a in a picture like sure. without like just looking well, at a photograph. If it's like you know by Van Gogh or something. Right, but there's emotional context <laughs> or to if Van there's Gogh. Titties in it. There's not an emotional context <laughs> to me snapping a Polaroid of the three of us sitting here right no, now. No, I mean you can literally invest in that. Oh, that's <laughs> a good point. Yes. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah, okay. Bravo. Sir. Uh, Thank you. It's actually, a whole discussion could be had out of uh, Cyrus's point about the word pretentious. But I will just say, without using that word whatsoever, that looking at the special features, it appears. That there is a short film about the movie on the disc, and I will leave you to come up with a new word for what that is. 
<laughs> but that is something that rhymes with smusmentious. <laughs> you know, I think that even people who are, are generally credited as being like across the board really brilliant can can do stuff that is that navel gazing. <laughs> uh, which actually, I'm going to skip down the list a little bit here because I want to talk about Cave of Forgotten Dreams, which of course is a new Werner Herzog film, which is a documentary about the Chauvet Cave in southern France, which. Which uh, I guess it's not recently discovered, but somewhat recently, all things sure. considered, uh, where the oldest cave paintings, much older than we thought people were drawing anything anywhere, were discovered 32,000 year old cave paintings. And some of them showing remarkably mature artistic styles, all things Incredible. considered. Yeah, you were like, no, nobody had ever seen anything like this by a good 10, 15,000 years. Yeah. It's like, wow, it's amazing. And Herzog goes in there as much as he's allowed to with a uh, a double camera setup so that he can get as close as he can simulate a 3D thing because in theaters and indeed if you have one of those expensive fancy schmancy 3D devices <laughs> home TVs uh, you can watch it that way what accent back to the did western? you just take? I don't know Go back to the western <laughs> section all it's, it's, it's the only accent I can do okay <laughs> <laughs> it's Doctor Who <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know Oh, but to bring that to the full point, we'll talk about the movie itself. This comes with an extra feature on it that's listed as a short film by by the director Werner Herzog called Ode to the Dawn of Man. Oh Thir- my shit. It's 39 oh. minutes. And guess what? It's just a featurette about the, how the score was put together. It's, it's not even mildly a short film, as it were. It is a it feature. It's certainly not a short film if it's 39 <laughs> yeah, and, and minutes. I know, it's not and, a short film. And in this case, I'll completely agree with you, but I will say that I want every Werner Herzog movie to include a Werner Herzog short film because that guy's short films are fucking insane. <laughs> well, this isn't one of them. This isn't Werner Herzog eats his shoe. No, no, this is oh, him. That, this is him just watching bad. the people compose the music, and that's about yeah, it. Yeah, I'll agree yeah. with you there. Although yeah. I really liked this movie. I know you did. And I this is a did movie you that not? I didn't dislike it. Okay. I don't see why people are as in love with it as they are. Well, I can tell you why. There's I like a lot it. of really really interesting stuff in there. Oh, uh, no, no question. Would not argue with that one. So, but Brian, you can, have the the podium sir well i can only speak for myself but one of the things that i really liked about it is um that i intentionally avoided this movie uh when it came out on on video for a couple of re- well the one reason is that i didn't understand the concept of a 3d movie that's a documentary based on cave drawings which are themselves 2d sure i just didn't understand how that was going to work and you know admittedly i didn't see the movie in 3d so i don't know how it looked in theaters but watching it in 2d I was like, oh, well, you know what? I could see where there is some, like, like there are drawings that are on cave protrusions, mm. and there's, like, simulated movement that the, the artists actually put in there. Um, like, in fact, they talk about how uh, the mammals, like the buffaloes and horses, are drawn with six and eight legs yeah. to simulate movement. Like, it's almost a, a proto-form of cinema. Yeah. So, to me, it's like, I can see where in 3D there is kind of a movement, and there is texture, and there, there are things that could definitely serve a 3D film. But I was really just fascinated by the subject matter and that was a surprise to me as much as anything else i you know i felt like this this had like about 30 minutes of like awe to it we're like oh my god that's so amazing they found this i mean think look at those pictures that's amazing and then another hour of okay you already showed us that and uh, now it's just Werner herzog mm-hmm. going so do you think that this represents man's spirituality and the whole shut up Werner? <laughs> <laughs> i was a little distracted the whole time though because Hearing Werner Herzog speak, I think of that internet meme where he reads Curious George. You're right, right. So I'm just like, the whole time he's talking, I'm just like... I would have liked it if there was a version of this that dubbed over his reading of Curious George, because there is that point where I was just like, oh, <laughs> shut the fuck up, dude. I would have liked it if he had asked Nicolas Cage to do some of the narration, <laughs> so... Uh, one of the neat things I think he does visually, though, they talk a lot about early on, how they're limited with how much they can use for lights, mm-hmm. because they don't yeah. want to damage. There's all sorts of considerations to not damage anything at all like there's a walkway they gotta they have to stay on they can only have but so many lights in a specific kind but they talk about how like early, early man when he was down there because it was just a cave then too uh would have seen all this stuff by flickering torchlight so there's a lot of visual stuff that the idea to give these pictures the the illusion of movement they try changing the lighting effects as you're watching the shots of them and moving it around and actually that is kind of interesting to watch it's kind of mesmerizing almost zen like after a while watching it but you do 
indeed have to be in exactly the right mood for it. And apparently I was. There's ten minute stretches of this film with almost no dialogue, just the music, and just watching light flicker over cave art. And okay, that's great, if that's your thing. I, I think, think they terrific. hooked me in early with the idea of proto-cinema. And also the, the like the laser projection of the cave, which I thought was really interesting. That was kind of neat. Where they had like so many different points like uh, of laser analysis where they could actually map like a 3D uh, image of the entire cave. Yeah. And also the cinematography outside of the cave I thought was really impressive. Like, there's a shot where the camera is hovering just over this little pond and then goes over like a low-hanging stone archway. So it's clear there's no way it was like attached to a helicopter. Right. Because it just, it doesn't make sense. But or like goes, an RC helicopter, maybe like a small. Possibly, but it just, it's so cool and it sweeps right through there and you... And then flips around and goes back. It's the it's the Pond d'Arc. It's the big, you know, the big stone archway that they show there and it goes through and then turns around all in a continuous shot and comes back through it. Well, once again, one of the best things about this is indeed the cinematography, which is pretty remarkable considering that inside the cave, they were so limited with mm-hmm. what they mm-hmm. can do. Yeah. Um, and they still managed to make it really watchable in that sense. I feel like it got brought down a lot because they just ran out of things to really say other than just conjecture about the philosophy of it all, which I just kind of find almost always to be kind of a, a, a pointless navel-gazing sort of affair <laughs> with that much distance involved. Uh, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people obviously felt very different. Brian, you obviously felt very different. But I still think this is a solid watch. I'd be curious to see it in 3D as well, just to see how yeah, it is. Yeah, now I'm kind of curious. Yeah. yeah, I have to go to one of my rich friend's houses. And <laughs> That's not this. me, and that's for sure. That is not you. <laughs> but let's move on to a title that, that uh, I don't think Brian got to see, but Luke did get to see. And oh, dear I have Lord. reported very fully on how I feel about this the most <laughs> banal film of the year oh, did and you, offensive I, 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 to I, I, the point of being offensive oh, I think it's, it's highly it's it's offensive to logic <laughs> and it's called that. larry crown now this is directed and stars tom hanks who of course uh did that thing you do which was a really well received movie fabulous film um one of my favorites and so it was kind of surprising that almost across the board everyone kind of went the whole universe went meh so Larry are you saying clown. this film yeah. is not his crowning glory? Oh. No, it's just him, Larry, clowning around. Oh! <laughs> Honestly, I love Tom Hanks. I do. And and Julia Roberts, to a certain extent. like the, Sometimes she's this wonderful. This should have been gold, it sh- it, all things considered. And what I honestly feel like is that this is Tom Hanks and his wife, Rita Wilson, doing a favor for their friend, Nia Vardalos. Yes, and who I personally can't stand, by the no, way. No, I can't stand I her I think either. My Big and, Fat and, Greek and, Wedding is one of the most overrated films ever made. The, 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 thing, the biggest problems with Larry Crown are the script. The screenplay yeah. is terrible for this film. Oh, it's film. awful. It's just ridiculous. And it, uh, Hanks' name is on it, and I honestly feel like Hanks just went in and said, all right, look... Rita wants to do this, and I love my wife. Yeah. And, uh, and the I, script I, is currently unshootable. I'm going to make it shootable. By, it still will be good, by but it will be shootable. By sheer force of charm of the actors yeah. involved. And it's film, It's the film's only real saving grace is, in fact, that Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts are so goddamn charming in it. They are, but oh my fucking God. Like Yeah. No, there's so much that goes terribly wrong in the story. And they're, they're literally just logic problems. Like... What, the the scene that that comes to mind uh, immediately is there's there's a scene where Julia Roberts and her husband break up and Larry Crown comes by on his scooter and sees her at a bus stop and gives her a ride home. She she has had nothing to drink that we're aware of. She went to dinner, so it's possible that she had a glass of wine at dinner. She has no bottle of alcohol to speak of. But by the time they get from the bus stop to her front door, she's, she's hammered. Yeah. And not just kind of kind of drunk. It is merely hammered. the intoxicating presence of Larry of, Crown. Yeah, it is, apparently. <laughs> it's just stuff like that that makes no goddamn sense. And See, like, Yeah, if it was an Ed Wood movie, people would be like, well, that's bad filmmaking. But if Tom Hanks is directing it, then it's like, oh, well, you know, that's an art film. <laughs> not only is she that hammered, but apparently by the morning she has, A, no hangover... And B was sober enough to pull all of her husband's stuff out into the yard and hook it back up, like his complex computer system. And Brian Cranston is apparently a terrible husband because he looks at the tamest internet porn of any man alive. Seriously, it's St- like he goes yeah, and surfs, he, he goes and surfs boobies on Google Images with all the filters on. Yeah, he, he's <laughs> she's pissed at him for looking at 
porn, yeah. and I'm using air quotes, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and it's so, it's so, this is The just, porn is still images of women in bikinis. And this is like, so typical of this writer, Nia, Nia how do you say her? Nia, Nia Bardalos? Bardalos. who is just presents this evil. ridiculously one-sided, like, picture of men. Yeah. And the idea of something is like, you know what, if he looks at porn, he's clearly not the man for you. You know what, it's like, what men, then you're looking for gay men. I don't know. <laughs> The Facebook you profiles. do look at porn, just not If you look at the woman. Facebook profiles of girls you went to high school with, is that porn? Because that's what it sounds like she thinks porn is. Yeah, Pretty much, yeah. She just she has an unrealistic view of the world, and the film is maudlin and, just, uh, and not terrible. funny. Not and funny, no. It's and the meat cute which, is never Which is cute. impressive, because it basically has the plot of Community. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, it should have the plot of Community. Uh, anyway. that, I mean, that basically Somebody plot. catch Larry Crown, for God's sake. Yeah, it's like he goes to Tom Hanks... Uh, worked at this company and they decided they can't keep him because they're looking for people with college degrees new now do that, that's the other thing like he basically works at Best Buy slash Target slash Walmart right he's happy in his job as like a floor manager he has no aspersions to get beyond floor he's manager he's clearly very good because he's been employed but they're going month. to fire him yeah. because he can't move past where he is and it's like yeah. that doesn't make any sense either like no t- Target is not going to fire some floor manager who's happy to be making his $13 an hour he decides to use his time and his save money to go back to community college to get a degree, and there he meets a very upset teacher played by Julia Roberts. Where eventually, of course, I'm sorry, what, what was her name? Uh, Mercedes Tainot. Tano or Tano? something? Yeah, I don't know. Look, these are not names. Yeah, <laughs> Brian Cranston is horribly wasted. It's as even more offensive her that Pam Greer is in it. And uh, she, wait, God. Pam Greer is in this? Yeah. Sam Greer is in it as like Julia Roberts' teacher. Friend. Oh, girl, you should uh, put up that. Oh, it's some yeah. shit. Unless she's also shooting people. Like I don't want to hear her spout that like blatant black stereotype. We've already run it into the ground, but the, possibly the most egregious thing occurs over the end credits. Where Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts are shot on the scooter against green screen, while backgrounds that look like the stock backgrounds from uh, Apple Photo Booth are <laughs> plastered behind. I swear, at one point there's like a Route 66 theme. Uh, it looks like uh, Nia Vardalos' six-year-old. Did oh, the, I forgot the one thing I did enjoy was this. George Takei in this. Uh, George Takei is moderately human. George Takei is, is in this. He actually has a pretty funny little role as another one. Oh of the my! Teachers, so. Oh my! <laughs> Uh, all right, so moving on. Here's a movie that I think we can say those. I, I don't know if you've seen it, Luke. I know you have, Brian, uh, but I suspect that you have. I have. But indeed. I uh, just absolutely adore. Saw long before the American remake came out, which was The Departed, the Martin Scorsese film that, of course, got Scorsese as much deserved, long time coming, first best director Oscar. But you know what? In a lot of ways, I like this original Hong Kong version better. a lot better. It's in I don't know if I would say a lot, but I well, like it better. I fell so madly in love with it when I originally saw it. And yeah, I saw the, it. The title is Infernal Affairs. Apparently, we're never going to get to oh, it. Right. Uh-huh. Yes. Sorry. Infernal Did I not say Infernal Affairs? No. You, you started to, and then Beardy over here Sorry, decided I just, to step I on Lots of interrupting. <laughs> Apologies. So this came out in 2002, Hong Kong film, starring the great Andrew Lau and Andrew Alan Mack. Uh, and it's one of those stories. All right, so it's a very complicated police story, but all the frills and the side plots and all that are cut out of this. This is a direct and to the point thriller, to the point where it's kind of confusing at points. Watching it's it the, incre- first time the first time, it's incredibly confusing. Yeah, and you and but you'll want to go watch it again. It's just so dense with information. But basically, it's a cop who is working undercover for the triads, but the triads figure out that there is a mole in the triads and said they ordered that undercover cop to discover who the undercover cop is in the yeah. triads. While meanwhile, the triads have an undercover guy who they sent through the police force to work undercover as a cop for the police force who, when the police force realized that there is a triad member in the police force, order him to uncover that person. So... If you've seen The Departed, this should all sound very familiar because the... It the, is the exact uh, plot. A lot of, the plot is completely intact from... From, from original to remake. Yeah, absolutely it is. And in fact, a lot of the ins and outs are. The, the end is slightly different, and I, I'm I'm with Cyrus on this one. I, I actually like the original ending a little better. I think it's more oh, yeah. satisfying. I do, too. Absolutely. Hey, but, uh, but Tony Leung and Andy Lau are fabulous and in Anthony playing Long. off of each other. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, who is never, ever bad in anything he does. Nope. Uh, uh, God, did you ever see this, the uh, untold story? 
with Anthony Wong. No. He was a, based on a true story of a serial killer who was killing people and making them into meat, <coughs> into meat buns. I've and actually borrowed them. this movie from you. I haven't watched it yet. Oh, fair enough. Okay, you got to watch it. It's absolutely fantastic. It sounds like dumplings. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but really, really great, really, really bloody. Anyway, so this is a really terrific film. I can't believe it took this long to get on Blu-ray. Unfortunately, it's not the best version of it. Um, it doesn't look all that great. I mean, really? it's the best version you can get. But wow, it's, ah, uh, yes, but I have the Hong Kong Blu-ray. So uh, is that true? Oh, so I don't know compared to the Hong Kong Blu-ray. It is the best one with a with a, a, a American release uh, that you can play on any Blu-ray player. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's the uh, thing is what I'm reading is that it is a far from perfect. Uh, version it's very schizophrenic about what looks great and what doesn't. oh that's unfortunate uh you know and it's yeah you know, all i can say is if the, if you haven't seen it who gives a shit yeah that's uh, yeah, yeah exactly you know watch it anyway this yeah is definitely yeah, watch absolutely. it on dvd like yeah. just watch this well, fucking still, film it still looks good on blu-ray it's just like i said it has this probably could have been a better transfer sure. yeah. and it certainly could have had you know a better i don't know it, it's such a great film i'm embarrassed that all it has is the tiny little bit bit of out of extras that it ported over from the previous dvd release i mean it's not much there's an alternate ending uh there's there's a behind the scenes look for like six minutes there's a making up for 15 minutes none of it is really that that is is going to set you on fire um i don't know i would love to have seen a comparative like you know a talk with martin scorsese and the director oh, yeah. of this back and forth about oh what was the different things they were thinking about uh well and the interesting thing is that you don't often see martin scorsese remaking asian films right or, so or remaking or remaking films, films oh, yeah. a lot in general well, it was just that good of a movie i mean yeah it really, it's fabulous it really, it really did, is and like, spawned two sequels? two sequels now yeah. i've only seen the second one which people do compare to the godfather 2 because it's kind of a pre it's part of prequel part not and it does it in that same way godfather 2 does yeah. where it flashes back and it's great it's a fucking kick-ass movie i've heard that three is not so good Kind of like Godfather 3. Yeah. Well, you know wow. what? If they hadn't gotten the Asian Sofia Coppola in it, it would have been much better, is all I can say. So, Son of a bitch. No ticky, <laughs> no laundry. <laughs> but yeah, I love this movie. Couldn't recommend it more. One of, one of my favorite films. Very, We're very, seeing, very good. Even if it doesn't look all that great. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? We're going to skip some of these, but we are not going to skip Three Amigos because, God <laughs> damn it, it's fucking Three Amigos on Blu-ray. And you know what? This is the first anamorphic version of this that's ever had a home release. The previous DVD Incredible. was not anamorphic, and it's... You know, which means if you guys don't know, it's like if you have an HD screen and you have those old DVDs where it's just a block in the center of your screen with like six <laughs> inches of black around it, that means it's they, not Yeah, anamorphic. they put out a lot of different releases in the wrong aspect ratio. They totally did. I would even say they put out a plethora of DVDs in the wrong aspect ratio. Really? Nothing, guys. <laughs> Come on. I was just. Well, it, it should be noted that it's it's still the right aspect ratio. It's just annoying. Yeah. Uh, now this... you couldn't laugh at my joke because I got the terminology wrong. <laughs> no, God no, damn it! It's... You're the worst Ed McMahon ever. I think I, I have to. I have to be. It. I have to be that guy and say. <laughs> That I've never seen the three amigos. Oh no! Now you get out. Well, you have right. to fix this. Now the thing about this is that this is a film that didn't perform well in the theaters at first, even though it's pretty much Galaxy Quest just set as a western. It kind uh, of is. No, it totally huh. is. It's like three kind of washed up actors playing badass cow- who used to play badass cowboys are really famous, played by Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short, who get mistaken by a tiny little Mexican town and very much a play off of uh, uh, the Magnificent Seven. I mean, the thing is a spoof of Magnificent Seven. See, I got that, but you're, you're blowing my mind with this know, with Galaxy, Galaxy Quest, Quest thing. Uh, what, to That hire them to come fight an evil group of gunfighters who is, you know, causing their town all kinds of shit they believe it's just an acting opportunity yeah the town believes they're really the cowboys because they live in a place where they they don't have a lot of access to things that would allow them to know the difference between fiction and reality yeah and in fact they live the village in it is the exact same village that the magnificent seven was shot with oh nice exact same village so kind of a neat little bonus thing to know and then of course the the big draw to this movie is the fact that it has this cast which is the comedy equivalent of like the 92 dream team oh yeah no doubt steve martin chevy chase and martin short work so great together in this and they're all in their prime it's funny because it's one of those scripts that have been floating around for a while and a lot of big comedy name actors had been cast in the roles and then had to move on because the production wasn't you know just wasn't happening for whatever reason they've been in the hands of a number of directors but it finally ended up uh coming to john landis who at this point was still on a high note in his career i forgot this was directed by john landis and you know what (laughs) 
they totally do it credit with this Blu-ray. It's not one of those half-assed things at all. It's a really great transfer of video and audio, which, goddamn, after being this long since they put out an anamorphic, really well-realized one. I mean, even the old one on a regular TV looked like shit. It was a terrible, terrible version. They have totally fixed this up like crazy, as well as it comes out with some halfway decent special features. 19 minutes of deleted scenes, most of which were originally intended to be included in the film, and the studio took it out of John Landis's hands and cut them without his Uh-oh. permission. So we're talking the good kind of deleted scenes. And these are ones that are never been seen before this. Nice. Yes, in HD, no less. So, I mean, come on, man. This is this is a great little release of one of my... You know, it's not one of my favorite comedy films, but it's one that I do keep coming back to. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. Well said, my little buttercup. Maybe not as much as Galaxy <laughs> Quest, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> By Grab Thar's Hammer. <laughs> By Grab Thar's Hammer. Well, let's talk about one that we all saw, and I can think we can safely say across the board. <laughs> Why don't you take this one, Brian? Because I know you were almost as enthusiastic as... I, even more enthusiastic than I was when I first saw it. Um, yes, this is. We're going to talk about a little film called Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Woo-hoo! Which, if you, <laughs> that's exactly the reaction totally everyone should have. That, by the way, <laughs> uh, it is a film that, if you are a fan of not even just horror comedies, but horror tropes in general, if you watch a lot of horror movies, this is a movie that speaks directly to you and actually puts a clever spin on a lot of the things that you've seen before. It's a story about. Tucker and Dale, uh, two actually good-hearted redneck type fellows that are going up to their their summer home, which is a cabin in the woods, yeah. uh, and they're going to fix it up and do a little fishing. Well, along the way, they run afoul of these really douchey teenagers, Sure. and the teenagers get it in their head that these two guys are evil killer rednecks, uh, and throughout the movie, a series of events unfold that lead these teenagers to further believe this, while the... <laughs> Like good natured Tucker and Dale have no idea what's going on, yeah. and they don't understand why teenagers keep killing themselves all around them. But well, that one of the funniest things I've ever seen in film is Alan Tudyk in tears trying to explain to Tucker how that guy just threw himself into the wood. Because <laughs> it's it's true that's what happened, but it's like there's no way to describe the series of events that led to a kid accidentally falling into a wood chipper. No, and I- and the whole time. And, and they actually do a, a funny thing on this on this Blu-ray where they recut the movie, they re-edit it so you just see it from the teenager's perspective. Yeah, so it seems like a more standard horror movie. So you can see exactly what they're seeing and why they think these two guys are killers, and it's so fucking funny. Well, a lot of the success of this has to do with the, the two leads uh, uh, played by... Uh, Alan uh, Tudyk. Yeah, Alan Tudyk and Tyler Labine. Tyler Labine, very underappreciated sort of newer comedy guy who I knew from the show Reaper, which I totally oh, adored, nice. but has appeared in a couple things since then. He's also the uh, hug it, shug it, football yeah, guy the, the from guy Zach and Mary. The in Zach and Mary and... Uh, and um, Jason Sudeikis' is, uh, friend in uh, A Good Old Fashioned Orchard. That's true. A very underappreciated comedy as well. Really Indeed. Like yeah, that one. very, very decent. A very it's, decent comedy. Yeah. It's um, very kind of Alan tr- Tudyk, of course, was Wash and Firefly. So Absolutely. He was also great thing. in uh, the original Death at a Funeral. Uh, you always. know, I'm not a fan of that film. Really? But, yeah, I know I really some people that like it, so... But it's oh, fascinating. Movie, yeah. It's really trendy right now to whenever there's a horror comedy, compare it to Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Uh, but this film, I feel like, earns it. And not only earns it, but is on par with Shaun. And for a very specific reason, is you have two guys that are completely oblivious to the horror story going on around them. And in this case, you know, they didn't do anything to deserve it, but they're being cast as the villains in this horror story. Well- it, and and they're they're just like I don't I, what's happening right now. Like in Shaun of the Dead, you've got two very lovable lead characters yes. who have a lot of very affectations particular to them. They're very well defined. Yes, uh, who are we're following through the story that is playing with the tropes of a very familiar horror, horror genre. But outside of that, it really doesn't have anything in common uh, with with Shaun of the Dead. It doesn't even have the same feel, except that you'll probably laugh just as much. This yeah. is a really truly great horror comedy. It's fantastic. Fantastic. And those don't come along that often. And it really is such a simple idea because the first five minutes of this film are just like the first five minutes of any slasher film you've ever seen. It feels it's, like a wrong turn sequel. It's the you know it's the teenagers and they're in the truck and they're going down the road and they have to stop at the gas station to get beer and they see the the two creepy rednecks and they're freaked out and you know that's how every horror movie starts and you know that that's going to come back 
And instead, we turn and we follow the two rednecks. Yeah. yeah. It's such a great twist. It's beautiful. And it's surprising. Salisbury and I were talking. It's just, it's surprising that nobody's ever thought of it, of doing that before. I, that's the biggest shocker of this film. And that's what I kept telling myself. Well, well, the first time I saw this set, I can't remember if it was Fantastic Fest or South By. It was one I think of it was them. South By. I think it was uh, South uh, But I sat there going... Are you sure nobody's already done this movie? It's I mean, fabulous. It's, just, yeah. it's baffling that no one had thought of doing it. And maybe it somebody did, but maybe they fucked it up. But yeah. the, the great thing is that they don't here, and uh, it turns out very, very well. It's a great yeah. script, great lead performances, and just a, it, an it's amazing a concept, a lot of fun. It's it's a great movie. Yeah, I, I can't praise this more highly, and it will probably get on my best of the year list. I liked it better the second time when I watched it with you, Brian, because... I being more aware of what's actually happening, seeing early on the sequences more from the kids' point of view is so much funnier if yeah, you I understand those characters. I felt the same already. way when I, 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 when my second viewing, I showed it to Luke. So it's like one of those things <laughs> just getting passed down like the fucking ring VHS tape. But I, yes. I can totally see watching this again sometime in the next month as well from friends going, hey, Definitely. we heard you've got Tyler. and Yeah, okay, sure. Sit down. <laughs> I'll make the popcorn and the whiskey and Cokes. Get, we'll get this started. Hell yeah, Tucker and Dale. All right, let's do one more, and then we'll take a break and do the final part of this. But you know what? Let's talk about a movie that you, you were raving about to me, Brian, and I somehow missed along the way because it played Fantastic Fest. I didn't get to see it. But uh, here, the American name of it is Kidnapped. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, and it was a 2010 Spanish thriller film that it could not have more of a self-descriptive title. It's a home invasion movie. That's all. Is. That's really all you need to know. It's, it's a bunch of guys break into a house and... Uh, to my recollection, and you'll forgive me if I'm a little fuzzy on all this, it's been a couple of years, but um, they really are just after money. Like, yeah. There's I, no I, deeper, like, they're not Satan worshippers. There's nothing in the house particularly that they're looking... They just want money. It's no, a, it's... In fact, I think, I think I'm correct here. I believe it's the... Uh, it's like the the movers or the yeah. maintenance. No, you're right. You're right. Or yeah. Something like that. Or at least one end. of them, anyway. Yeah. yeah what, they were basically just like casing the, nice the joint. Yeah. yeah. And there's not much like. It's not a complicated tale. It's no, it's very, very basic. Straightforward. It's very fly on the wall. Watching these stories as they take the father out of the family to empty out ATMs with mm-hmm. all of his, the various families' accounts, which means waiting for 15 minutes and then going back <laughs> again repeatedly. Whereas the mom and the daughter and the daughter's friend are tied up inside the house sure. and are having to deal with two very different mindset criminals who are playing mm-hmm. the two remaining guys there. One of which is clearly a little on the edge who's snorting coke every time he gets a chance yeah. and is very abusive and the other just wants to get out of here without a murder one charge after yeah, right. to his ticket and it's funny that like I, some people uh, criticize this for the lack of complexity in the story and if you just looked at the script you'd probably go eh whatever it is but, very basic but it's what the director does with it it's the style of it and the vision he has for that and just quite frankly some of his camera tricks that he does yeah that make this so incredibly gripping and and mostly it's just it's deeply deeply disturbing and in a way that's not like i don't i don't like i don't like to use the word disturbing here because it's not a torture porn movie yeah no not at all it's not a movie that uses extremity as a crutch it's just it's very visceral. It's yeah, visceral is the perfect word for it. It is absolutely visceral, and you see things that you can't unsee, but they don't feel unmotivated. Yeah. They don't feel inorganic. But it's very stark and bleak yeah. and unflinching, I think. Yeah. Uh, but frankly, Cyrus was saying with camera tricks, uh, it, towards the end of the film, it does some absolutely stunning split screen yeah. sequences. Oh my god, yeah. That so good. somehow merge together into the same I shot. I still haven't figured that one out. Brilliant. It, yeah, it's one of those it's, things. I mean, it's just, it's really, it's like, it's like complex choreography, you know, just saying, all right, I need to be here at X time and, I would have and all that, to but have it's been incredibly the, done. I would have yeah. hated to have been the editor on this. Oh god. Because it would have been so I would have hated to be the DP on this movie. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to have this camera come in from two blocks away and this one's still in the house and eventually you're going to meet in this room. No, it felt like a Tom Twyker trick, like something he would have done. Sure, definitely, you know? like Romo uh, Run. Yeah, and it's very, very impressive. Uh, also, the performance in particular of the young daughter in this. Yeah. There is an image of her in this film that will leave stick in your head oh. for a long time afterwards as just... I mean, it's not like it's disturbing in a, a sense of like, oh my god, she's getting raped or something like that, like in that scene. It's just the, the performance of her yeah. is just... It's just startling. It, it wakes you up. And yeah, this is a great film for people who, it's not that it's gory, it's just, it really is shocking and brutal without 
a gore. It's... This it's, is the kind of movie that's going to make you want to invest in a handgun and a Brinks home security system. Yeah. <laughs> like, do you like watching the horror movies where people who may have come over to laugh and have fun shut the fuck up after 15 minutes and just Yeah, if you have those movie? friends that think that they're going to be funny and talk through the whole movie, show them this. They will not. Yeah, look at their twisted, agonized faces at the end as a badge of, of accomplishment. All right, before we take a break, got some more giveaway stuff. Giveaways! I love you guys. <laughs> All right. Oh, here's shit. one of the things that I was excited about. I, shit, man. I got sent this a while back, and I was like, oh, my God, best present ever. If, if none of you wins this, I'm going to fucking take it. So I, you better pay attention to these comment sections. This is the mini series, or not mini series, the television series. All of it. All, uh, what is it? Uh, five seasons plus a bonus uh, disc called Seven Wonders of the Solar System of the universe. It's the universe mega collection. And if you like really high end documentary series about totally fucking awesome shit, this is about as good as it gets. I mean, Oh my God, it's talking about the whole universe, all kinds of crazy shit. There's like time travel, there's black holes. There's kind of just stuff that you probably, you should know about because sooner or later a meteorite is going to hit our planet and either we're going to slip into a parallel timeline or we're all going to die. So (laughs) maybe both. It's just that simple. Yeah. (laughs) And, Anyway, so we've got this set. It is huge, and it's on Blu-ray, which means it looks gorgeous. I mean, it really does look gorgeous. Uh, yeah, the, the universe. Keep your eyes out, out for that. The second runner-up on that, <laughs> or the da, runner-up da, 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 on da, da, da. that, will get the uh, the 3D edition of the universe, Seven Wonders of the Solar System by itself, which will play in a standard Blu-ray player as well. It's just the ex- basically the, the extra disc added to the set. But once again, in three up for 3D television sets, which I do admittedly kind of wish I had. I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, hey, is that shit in 3D? Who wouldn't want to see that? That's pretty awesome. Uh, one more thing before we go to the break. I have, I'm saving the best thing for last, but I, I have the Mike Hammer, Mickey Splain's Ooh. Mike Hammer set starring, starring Davin, Darren McGavin, who I, I remember from Kolchak the Night Stalker, yeah. which was the sort of pre, the, the pre-X-Files. And I always remember him <laughs> as the dad from A Christmas Story. Oh, that's right. He was that. But uh, it's not, okay, so <laughs> it's not as dark as like some of the Mike Hammer adaptations you might have seen in film, uh, And but it is darker than the Stacey Keach ones. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a damn good series. It's uh, multiple discs, 78 episodes on 12 discs. It's it's damn entertaining. And I think this is something that anybody, especially if you just listened to our film noir episode and you got a taste for it, you're going to like this. Hell yes. So let's take a break and we'll be right back with the final segment, the final summation. <laughs> 